All right. Hello again. Uh, there has been a few more folks jump in since we started. So welcome uh, to those of you that are just now joining. Um, uh, my name is Holly Mays. I'm the Assistant Director of Governmental Affairs for Associated Students. Uh, today's topic is interpersonal violence prevention and care. We have Sven from uh, the CARE office joining us. Uh, Deanna, do you want to jump in and introduce yourself? Uh, for sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Diana Puente. I serve as the Interim Director for Community Affairs, uh, Student Development, and Leadership. Um, so happy to join you all today. I will be the staff uh, supporting uh, this session today and really happy to have Sven Runman with us. Sven is with CARE and he will be taking us through an, an important uh, session this afternoon. I just want to give you a small um, housekeeping note which is that please at the end of the session uh, please make sure that you are uh, registering or logging out of the session and i will provide that link for you all um, so that you are able to uh, be counted as present uh, during this session so with that being said uh, sven we'll just hand it over to you thank you all uh good afternoon everyone um wow and it looks like the number is still going up higher and higher so we have a big crowd with us today but uh Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. It's nice to see faces. Um, before I really get started, some housekeeping. Um, the first part of the training today, we're gonna be talking a lot about more support measures and supportive services that are on campus through the care office um, and a little bit about what our advocates do for advocacy services and then um, the second half, but really the majority uh, of this afternoon is gonna be talking about um, recognizing warning signs, but providing you with literally lifelong skills on how to intervene um, when seeing harm happening or leading up to harm happening and, and how can you potentially stop, stop that um, altogether. And so uh, that's our Green Dot program. And Gianna is actually uh, going to come back and be a team member uh, uh, whenever that, well, you were before remote work started, but um, housekeeping real quickly so if we're there's if there's going to be some interaction going on so uh the chat box is going to be heavily utilized today um for the most part you can just send those chats directly to me sven um and then i can read uh, a lot of those responses out um but then also we are going to be utilizing the breakout rooms um and uh, for later on in this training. And so I'll be sure to give you all further details and instructions on those activities whenever we get to them. But, um, but yeah, and again, I just wanna reiterate for if folks feel comfortable enough, I'd love to see faces. I'm a people person. I thrive off of seeing energy from other people through a screen. I'm, oh, I really wish we could be in person, um, but unfortunately we can't right now. And um, yeah, I just, any, any, any interaction that we can get throughout this training today uh, would be great. So um, I am going to share my screen. Oh, hi, Leah. I didn't see that you were in here. Um, let's see here. Also, please give me grace and patience. This is only like the third or fourth training I've done over Zoom. And literally every single time I've done this training, uh, it's been different. And so, uh, and there's been different challenges. And so being just nimble uh, and providing me some patience and grace. Thank you. Cool. Can y'all see this screen right here? Like the, um, just that. I wanna see if I can pull up my notes real quickly. Yeah, that's cool. Um, can y'all still just see the PowerPoint or do y'all see my notes as well? Just the PowerPoint. Oh, yes. Okay, cool, so it's gonna work out. So, before we also begin, um, I also just wanna provide a content warning. Um, today we are gonna be talking about some, um, we're gonna be talking about a sensitive topic and a heavy topic. And uh, I just want y'all to take, uh, Take care of yourselves however you see fit and whatever that is for you and so if that means stepping away from the computer for a couple minutes um going to the restroom grabbing some water please feel free to do so 
Um, just I want to make sure to provide that uh, content warning before we go forward. So, oh, wow, I didn't even introduce myself. I'm so sorry. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Sven, Sven Rundman. I use he, him pronouns. I am the Assistant Director of Prevention Education for the CARE Office. Uh, most folks don't know what CARE stands for, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it out loud for y'all. It's the Campus Advocacy Resources and Education Office at UCSB. All CARE or all UC campuses have a CARE office. Um, I have been here for a little bit over a year now. Um, it was quite the first year on the job, not going to lie, uh, uh, having to switch everything to remote work, but um, super excited to be here. I moved here from the Midwest. I've lived all over, and uh, this position was sort of like a dream come true to be able to do the things that we do in the care office, uh, but now I get to do that for a living, and so um, really excited to be here, and yeah, we just started our student staff training for our peer educators last week. And so we have six peer educators, um, and hopefully y'all will have some interaction with them. And I can talk a little bit more about how to get involved with the CARE office and any programming and training later on. So what does the CARE office do? Um, our primary purpose is to work with students who have experienced inter interpersonal violence. So whenever I use that overarching term, that interpersonal violence refers to three specific things, uh, sexual assault, dating, domestic violence, and stalking. Um, we switched off the words relationship violence and dating, domestic violence, but um, they're all under that same umbrella term. Um, we also host a lot of educational programming and campaigns across campus. For instance, Green Dot is something that y'all are gonna hear a little bit more about uh, in a little bit. Um, for students, faculty, and for staff on campus. Uh, and we work specifically with survivors of interpersonal violence that have been directly impacted, but also roommates, loved ones, and parents who are close to somebody else who has experienced any of these forms of violence. Uh, and we essentially just work to train and educate people to respond appropriately when a student discloses that they've experienced interpersonal violence, as well as ultimately trying to end this type of violence altogether within our campus community and within um, Isla Vista on campus, wherever you are in the world, essentially. Um, we'd like everybody to be able to learn free from harm. And so that is essentially the overview of what we as CARE do. So our care advocates are confidential. I will repeat multiple times throughout this presentation that our entire office is confidential. Um, we provide confidential support to students, faculty, or staff that have been impacted by sexual assault, dating, domestic violence, or stalking. Um, essentially, confidentiality means that a student can speak privately with an advocate about what their rights are, resources, and their options without reporting the incident to the university or law enforcement. Um, it's essentially just a place for, it provides survivors with like a safe space to talk with somebody and get, uh, get whatever support feels best for them. Ultimately, the survivor makes the decisions that they want for themselves. Um, our advocates essentially provide guidance and support through their needs uh, and all survivors have unique needs given their situations and so um, and that's also why we use the survivor term is we it's an empowerment model um, and we believe that survivors are the best ones to make their own decisions for themselves and so again advocates just sort of help guide them throughout the process um, and provide them with any support that they may need going forward um as you can see we offer a whole lot of different types of support and these various ways that we can support survivors looks different dependent on the needs of that survivor um i'll get into that a little bit in a second but um we kind of we call it our advocacy wheel but those six at the bottom are basically the highlights of each of those um, areas that we cover so again, a lot of people often ask, like, what does the care office do? Um, our advocates are here to provide options to a student who's experienced uh, sexual assault, dating, domestic violence, or stalking. Uh, confidential advocates explain a student's options and rights 
including the option not to report. Uh, students have a variety of concerns and needs after potentially experiencing violence. And um, the next slide will show you a little bit more of a snapshot of the different things that we help out with. But um, the care office understands that every experience is unique and we support students in making decisions that are right for them when navigating their options. Um, for instance, one of the things that we could do, uh, our advocates can help get someone who is in an abusive relationship connected to counseling um, or help somebody who is being stalked to switch their class schedule if they feel that they need to. Um, care advocates could also go with students to their medical appointments or court appointments and sit through judicial hearing processes with students. Uh, when we're on campus, usually we actually, the advocates will do a warm handoff essentially and walk students from one resource to another resource to make sure that they're connected to the appropriate services, uh, especially to make sure that they don't have to navigate all of these services and resource resources by themselves. Um, our main priority is helping the students get the resources that they need and the help that they need to continue with their education here on our campus. Um, and while we're remote instruction and remote school and remote work, uh, all of our care services are still available. Um, all of our appointments are basically over Zoom and or phone. And uh, folks can still, I'll get to this at the end, but uh, folks can reach out to us uh, either through our online website appointment form or by calling the 24 seven line on the back of everyone's uh, student ID card. So as I was mentioning, hopefully it's not too blurry, hopefully it's showing up for y'all, but um, as I was mentioning just a second ago, uh, there's a really a wide variety of options and for ways that we can support students here on campus. And uh, like one, for instance, one of the areas, uh, one of the areas that we can focus on is like if they, if a survivor wanted to make a report to law enforcement, um, because that can be, an, it can be intimidating for some people to make uh, reports to law enforcement. Uh, both UCS PD and officers from the Isle of Vista Foot Patrol um, will, when we're on campus, will actually come directly to the office to take a report from that person. Um, we work closely with both agencies and both work hard to make sure the students are comfortable if they do decide to report to the police. Uh, during remote campus operations, uh, we can still connect with these agencies over Zoom uh, to take reports, and it doesn't matter where that individual may be, we can also help connect them with their local police department if they uh, choose to have them investigate as well. So it's just not for, uh, it's just not for trying to file reports here in IV or within the Santa Barbara area. Even if somebody is just living elsewhere, uh, our advocates will do whatever they can to best support them and connect them with the proper resources in the area that they may be living in. Um, and advocates can explain a, stu uh, a student's options for reporting to police or to the Title IX office here on campus. Um, even without reporting, survivors have a right to change housing or request a schedule change and other accommodations as part of their Title IX rights. But it's important to note that not everyone on campus or that works for the university is a confidential resource. Um, some people, such as like RAs, professors, um, and most staff on campus have an obligation to report instances of violence to the university. Uh, and care advocates and counselors at CAPS are completely confidential. And those are the two important ones to remember. So all individuals are encouraged to utilize our services, um, including friends or maybe someone knows somebody who is in a harmful relationship or experienced something harmful and you just aren't sure how you can best support them. I encourage you to reach out to the care office to schedule an appointment with an advocate to see how you can best support that person and that friend. Um, it's just not, our services are just not for people who've been directly impacted by the violence, but also people who've been indirectly affected. So that could be a family, a family, friend, best friend, loved one, um, it doesn't matter who. Um, anybody can reach out to care to provide that and then we can provide support services for them. 
Um, and again, the populations we serve, it doesn't matter when or where uh, or who has been impacted. We want that person to connect with our support services and our advocates. Um, even for students that might be in an international location, our advocates will still support that student the best that they possibly can and connect with them, um, however that may be. Um, and so it's just important for folks to uh, understand and know that. So we can still do all of our support services no matter where people are across the world. So when we are on campus, eventually, fingers crossed, we have two different locations. One location is actually on campus and the other one is within Isla Vista. Um, our on-campus location is in the Student Resources Building uh, located in the WGSE. So as soon as you walk into the front of the SRB, before you walk up those stairs immediately, um, right where that Women's Center door is, there's a big old sign and there's kind of a hallway to take you to the back left corner of the care office. Um, and then we know that some folks don't feel comfortable enough, that's a barrier to go to a women's center location to receive support services. And so another location that we do also offer is in, within um, the Gaucho Support Center, which is on, that location is on the second floor of the GSC, the GSC. And that building is located to the left of Embarcadero Hall and behind nonstop. Um, so yes, we have those two locations on campus. Otherwise, everything else is going to be remote um right now this is a screenshot of our website for how to access our support services and how to make an appointment um essentially anybody could fill this form out uh for information on how to seek care services um and like how to educate your community if you wanted to reach out to a program how to get involved is another tab uh up there as well but uh anybody could also call the care crisis line at any time for support and helping um and helping get the support and they, that that person might need and just an example so like our your student id card right literally on the back they're confidential, you probably can't even really tell, but confidential, it's not even gonna go through. Confidential sexual, confidential support for survivors of sexual violence. The care number is literally listed number one. And then STESA, standing together in sexual assault, is number two. And then the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is number three. But um, it's right on the back of that ID card as well. Somebody have a question? No? Okay. Uh, let's see here. I just want to remind folks that confidential care advocates are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and do you want to go inside? They, I don't want to go inside. Do you want to go inside? Apologies, Sven. It's all right. Um, when we are in person, students can, anybody can actually just walk into the care office uh, and try to make an appointment and get in to see an advocate right then and there. Um, it obviously looks a little different with everything being remote and nobody really on campus, but uh, that phone number, when somebody calls that line, that 24 seven line, there will always be a human being on the other side of that phone. They won't talk to an answering machine, like they will actually talk to a real human being on the other side, um, which I know can be comforting for some people uh, and whatnot. So let's see here. Now, Diana, can you remind me if, is Title IX coming in to do a presentation for this group? Yes, uh, Title IX is one of the, the trainings. Okay. Good to know. Um, so 
within within your capacity as an AS member, Title IX will get into more of your responsible employee obligations. Um, but for our sake, for the care portion and for the care training, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how can how you can best support somebody who uh, might this close to you. Um, and so trauma informed response. So we kind of have these bullet point areas, acknowledging them and compassionately interrupting them. That's the best way that we can come up with um, informing folks on their responsibility to uh, let the university know about an incident, um, sharing resources and potentially following up if that is appropriate. So I will say that because Title I mean, Title IX is going to come in to talk more to y'all, but within your capacity as AS students, um, I'll just let Title IX actually handle that. Right. So let's say you're at, let's say you're within your capacity as an AS Senate member. Everybody on this call is just the Senate, right? I don't really know how to ask that question. There are also other leaders of our boards, commissions, and units that are um, uh, taking this training as well. So you've okay. got leadership from a few different areas. Okay, cool. Um, well, it, in whatever capacity you are in within AS, um, if somebody were to disclose to you that they had experienced some sort of harm that could be related to like sexual assault, dating, domestic violence, stalking, the first thing is obviously to believe them and to support them. Um, these are just examples of things that you could say. Thank you so much for sharing me. Thank you so much for sharing this with me. Um, uh, I believe you and I want to support you. Uh, just simply telling people that, that you believe them can be huge. Um, it can help start that healing process for them. Um, letting them know, hey, that, it, that, that, that took a lot of power for you to open up for me. Like, I really appreciate you opening up to me. Um, I realized this was not easy for you to share with me. Um, just simple things to help acknowledge uh, the harm that that person had just experienced. And so acknowledging, believing them, supporting them, uh, informing them, so the compassionately interrupting them. Um, these are just examples of things that you can say. Uh, just letting them know like, hey, I'm not a confidential resource. I still wanna be able to get you the services and the support that you may need, but I just wanna let you know that um, I may need to share information with Title IX. And so uh, obviously connecting with them with the care office, maybe even offering like, I'm not confidential, but hey, uh, I just went to this care training and I know there's confidential care advocates. Is there any way that I could potentially help connect you with them and maybe call the care line literally right then and there, or maybe fill out that appointment form. Um, and then even yourself as a responsible employee, um, you could also talk with an advocate just to make sure like, Hey, what are my obligations? Like, is this something that I need to report? Um, the care advocates will help you navigate that as well. Sharing their resources. Uh, so obviously sharing them, CARES, con CARES resources, and how to get in touch with us. Um, like if it's okay with you, I'd just like to share CARES information. Um, or maybe they're more in the community and they may not necessarily be within like IV. Uh, sharing them STESA's information as well, or DVS, which is Domestic Violence Solutions. Um, and they're located up more towards Santa Maria area. Um, just letting them know that you want to be able to provide resources and you want to be able to support them. Um, and maybe w when we're on campus again, potentially walking somebody over to the SRB, like I mentioned earlier, a little warm handoff, uh, to make sure that they really get connected with the support that they may need. And then if it's, and if it is appropriate, just ask like, Hey, I hope you're doing okay. Um, let me know if they're out, let me know if they're is anything else that I can do for you and what you need? Um, I just want to check in. Is everything all right? Do you need any more support? Do you need any more resources? Then maybe helping that person navigate where to get more resources if they haven't connected with us already. So how to support somebody who just closes the dues. 
um, listen with empathy and believe them, validate their feelings, let them know it's not their fault and they're not alone, connect them with care and seek support for yourself too. I think that's a really big one because uh, that's secondary and tertiary trauma. When somebody shares something traumatic with you, that is actually what people in our field and trauma fields refer to secondary and tertiary trauma. And so um, making sure that you, for somebody who might have heard somebody disclose to you, get support for yourself as well and just take care of yourself. Don't question them, please. Uh, do not push for unnecessary details. Um, do not forget to let them know about the care resources. Like if there's literally one thing that you need to like to do, it's, it's to tell them that you believe them and to provide them with the care resources. Um, and do not minimize what happened. Every situation is incredibly unique um, and the needs for and the support for that survivor is completely dependent on that survivor's experience. And so don't minimize about what happened. Um, and again, don't forget to let them know about resources with the care office. Also, I just wanna make another note on self-care. Um, I don't know about y'all, but wow, Zoom College is, I don't know how y'all are doing it, uh, to be 100% honest with you. Uh, I like, please take care of yourselves, however that may be. I know I've now started to really create hard boundaries with myself and work. Um, when you live and you work in the exact same room, um, it's so difficult to not feel like I'm always on the clock and always like I took a sick day two weeks ago on a Monday and it it oh it bugged me and I felt so guilty for not even checking my phone and emails all because I was in the same room as where I was working and so I just want to say like whatever that may be for you whatever kind of self-care that is um routines are really great and do really wonderfully great things for me. And so, um, yeah, just please take care of yourself, uh, however you see fit and whatever does work best for you. Um, we're all in this together. Um, and yeah, I just wanna make sure that I can also support y'all the best way that I possibly can. Um, so yeah. Now, before we begin, does anybody have any questions? Okay, I saw a comment. Um, cool. Yeah, uh, Aaliyah, I'll talk with, I'll make sure to note that and um, re reframe that before we get off. And I'll also make sure that, I think Rachel's probably gonna end up doing your Title IX um, training, I think. I believe that's right. Okay. Uh, so, uh, somebody asked a question is, I'm sorry? I just wanted to ask a clarification. Yeah, sure. When you noted that the folks were able to receive services from CARE and you mentioned in their friends and, and other folks that are not UCSB affiliates necessarily, is that, just to be clear, is that not about referring them directly, but that that UCSB affiliates can get support for dealing with something that's happening to someone else? Meaning that if there was an SBCC student, for example, who had mm. had an incident happen to them, the suggestion here would not be that we refer the SBCC student to care, but that the person who knows the SBCC student could consider using care as a resource for them processing their secondary or tertiary trauma? Is mm -hmm. that? The, the latter. I also just want to point out though that like we're not going to turn somebody away just because they're not within the university system if that makes sense um even if an sbcc student were to connect with us um right like the resources on our campus 
might not be the best for them because they're an SBCC student, but our advocates would make sure that they get the support that they need and they get in contact with the correct um, uh, individuals, maybe at SBCC or at STESA, because I don't believe SBCC has uh, a care version of an office. Um, but yeah, we, we, we don't, we don't, we never turn people away. Literally, it doesn't matter who reached out to us. It's just that our services for support are more geared towards UCSB, the UCSB population and uh, like the IV community itself. Wonderful. Thank but we, we work hand in hand with STESA and DVS. And then uh, is there a specific care advocate assigned to a student that might come forward? Um, to answer that question, there is not a specific care advocate. It really is kind of done. Our administrative assistant, Carissa, will, based on that person's availability, if they were to schedule an appointment with an advocate, whatever lines up best with uh, an advocate's calendar. But they will also, if somebody were to request a specific advocate, they'll do their best to get them in with that advocate as well. And so folks can request if they want, or they can also um, just see what advocate they, they, uh, they get with their, first, with their first appointment. And then, yeah, uh, another question about, is AS required to report to Title IX? I, I don't work for Title IX, um, and Aaliyah actually pointed out, I, you know, I did not even realize that because AS pays y'all, because y'all are your own unique nonprofit, you technically don't work for the university. So I would actually, I'm going to make a note, actually, and make sure that Rachel covers this thoroughly. Any other questions? Oh, there's so many pages of people on this call. Wow. Yes, what's up, Sydney? Oh, I'm anticipating this question. <laughs> uh, this call, this is going to. Go ahead. Sorry, I just I, I signed up for this and I just don't know if I should just sign up for a different one because I have I'm on the swim team and I have to talk to a recruit at three. So I can't like be late to it. So I don't know if I should just like sign up for another one of these trainings. If I'm going to be doing a second training, I believe on the 23rd okay. on a Wednesday in the afternoon uh, or I think it's in the afternoon. Uh, yeah, you could probably jump on halfway through if you wanted to like after the 30 minute mark because it's going to be the same exact presentation okay okay cool so do you think we won't be done by three so i should just like do the other one? no we will not be done by three okay awesome thank you so much sorry you're welcome no problem uh cool, cool. According thanks for the reminder holly hi sorry can i ask a quick question as well yeah um, I really liked the slides that you had about how to like respond with empathy. So I was wondering if we were going to have access to those just so like we can have that information with us or is that sure. just your thing? Yeah, no, I can, uh, I can send the slides to, uh, to, to Holly and Diana so that way y'all can get access to that content. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Cool. All right, so uh, if we can, using the reaction button, like to put, I don't know, or yeah, let's do a, maybe a smiley fit or uh, no, actually, technically, don't y'all, can't y'all do thumbs up and thumbs down? 
Is that an option that y'all can do? Yeah, it's thumbs up or clap the hand. It's near the bottom for the one who's here. I don't know. I see a thumbs up. Um, all right, well, let's just do a th let's just do thumbs thumbs up, everyone. If you if you have heard about Green Dot or attended anything Green Dot related. folks here. Okay. That's not bad. All right, cool. About half of y'all. Okay. So Green Dot is our uh Green Dot is our bystander intervention program um for the whole university in and of itself. Uh that is our logo. When I first started this job back in July of last year in 2019, we had Green Dot for, Deanna, you were on the team, like three, four years, we didn't have a logo. We didn't even know how to market because we didn't have any, like we now have t-shirts. I'm even wearing one of my Green Dot shirts for today's training, right? Um, we literally just, how would people know about a program if there wasn't really a logo or anything to go along with that? And so, uh, Carlos Nash, who's the director for diversity programs in Grad Div, he actually worked with a student to develop that logo. And I thought it's like the perfect logo for UCSB, but also our Green Dot program. Again, Green Dot is related to interpersonal violence. So sexual violence, dating domestic violence, and stalking. Um, and I, in full honesty, like I didn't really ever think I was ever, I didn't know I was going to do this for a living. I truly just like fell into this kind of work. Um, I thought I wanted to be a history major and then it was psychology. And then it wasn't until my master's program um, at the University of Tennessee that one of my internships was doing this work itself. And I didn't really understand the severity and the urgency behind it. Um, I come from a very, very privileged place being a white male. Um, and I quite frankly just did not fully comprehend the topic in and of itself and just the harm uh, that this is. And the thing that really drove it home for me was my best friend on this planet for the last, we've been best friends for eight years now since the beginning of grad school or since the beginning of college basically and it wasn't until our like junior year it will well let me back up we've been best friends for like eight nine years now but it wasn't until i started doing this work full time that he had told me that he had actually been in a very manipulative and abusive relationship with an ex of his from college um and when he told me that, I quite frankly started having all of these memories and visualizations of like these moments in time where I was in his apartment and his ex was belittling him, berating him, putting him down, literally using his depression against him to keep him in the relationship. That's how messed up that is and it was. Um, and he obviously wanted to tell me because I was going to be doing this type of work and I was going to be talking about this type of work more and more with him. And he obviously wanted to know, wanted me to know the experience, the experience that he has. And when I started having these like visualizations and these memories starting to come back to me, like I remember, I just, I remember these like moments where I, could hear her belittling and berating him. And I just didn't know what to, like, looking back, I didn't know what to do. I, I like, how did, I, how did I know that was even a warning sign if I didn't know what harm was in the first place? Um, I didn't understand it at all. But thinking back, I really wish I knew what to do, how to recognize that and how to actually intervene and stop it potentially from getting any harmful um, or maybe p potentially uh, helping him get out of that relationship. Um, faster, right? But at that time, I did not know these green dot skills. And quite frankly, these are literally lifelong skills. You can use these skills, not just for interpersonal violence, 
if somebody's being racist, you can use these skills that, that you're going to learn throughout this presentation specifically on how to intervene. Um, if you're seeing microaggressions, you can use the 3Ds. I'll talk about those 3Ds later on. But um, that's what ultimately got me into this work is, uh, I mean, statistically speaking, every single one of us that's on this call right now knows somebody who has experienced some sort of violence. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've done this workshop and our longer training, like our four hour training that we have, which we can't do it virtually, but in our four hour training, we ask a lot of these anonymous questions and every training I've been in, at least half the audience has been directly impacted by this kind of harm. And like I said, we all know somebody who has been impacted, whether we know that or not. Um, and the only way that we're actually really going to change the culture, not only when within Isla Vista on our campus in our community, but we need to reevaluate our norms and we need to recreate new social norms. Um, but a lot of the times we think that culture changes are these really big drastic things that need to happen. But we often forget that culture changes happen all the time from the way we dress, the music we listen to, the food we eat. Um, literally, we all had to learn new behaviors with social distancing. Within like a month, all of us had to learn like, oh, six feet, right? Like there's still moments for me now where like I'm in line and I get really close to somebody. I'm like, oh, wait, like I, I literally completely forget because there's such new norms and new behaviors we're supposed to have. Um, and so it's important for folks to understand that culture changes happen all the time. Um, the big one that we like to mention is social media in and of itself. So when social media kind of really first started, it was what MySpace, and then Mark Zuckerberg stole the idea for Facebook, and now it's a massive company, right? Um, but it was like, I mean, just over a, you know, just over a decade or something like that. Like, there's billions of people that use social media every single day, and it started out as this really, really small thing, and it was people taking these small moments throughout their day to literally just make an account and then to start posting stuff online. Um, to really bring it home for folks, Santa Barbara itself was kind of the epicenter for plastic bag bans and, and banning plastic bag, single bag use, right? Um, and now that's taken over so much of not only the state, but in different parts of this country. And it, look, it started here within our own community and now it's this huge wide phenomenon um and it just takes these small incremental changes to s slowly start to add up over time um the oh sorry i always forget about these animations right so like it's one person having a conversation with a couple more people which leads to more and more people which leads to more and more like right it's starting to get to this critical mass and then it just kind of takes over right um the big thing is that a lot of people and a lot of small behaviors that's when culture changes really start to happen um the famous quote is no one has to do everything everyone has to do something Right, I'm not asking y'all to make a new social media platform. We have enough already. We don't need another TikTok or something like that. Um, and I'm not asking y'all to be in charge of Green Dot. I'm literally just asking y'all to do small, simple little things that eventually start to add up over time that will eventually start to really change the culture itself. Um, so the way that we like to talk about this work is by giving everything a label. So red dots and green dots and then proactive green dots. I'll explain all these a little bit more, but um, red dots. So visualize our campus, right? Um, this was a screenshot from green dot, the actual program itself, right? So red dots themselves are those moments in time where 
somebody uses their words or behavior to cause harm to somebody else. So red dots, here's even the definition, right? So each time there's a single act of a sexual assault, dating violence, or stalking, or any kind of harm, the small red dot is gonna pop up on that map, right? So a single red dot could be the moment it takes to hit somebody. Another red dot could be somebody forcing sexual or physical contact as part of, as part of hazing or initiation. Another red dot could be somebody having sex with somebody without their consent. It could be somebody using their words um, to threaten, coerce, or humiliate someone. Another red dot could be somebody showing up unwanted outside of somebody's work, class, work, uh, car, right? So all of these red dots begin to add up. And then on this map, that's essentially the culture that's existed. It's this map of all these little types of harm that are going on across our campus within our community. Um, and before we really get into that, we're going to have an activity actually. So this is going to require breakout rooms. And how many people do we currently have on this Zoom? We have 65 people. Whoa. So what's going to happen is, let's see here. Um, So I'm gonna break y'all up into I'm gonna break y'all up into three rooms, and what's gonna end up happening? And Diana, I think you're gonna be sent into it. Holly, you're gonna be sent into a breakout room um, on accident. But I'm currently renaming them. Uh, but for what's gonna happen is. I'm going to send everybody into a breakout room and depending on what breakout room you go to, I want you to just brainstorm and list as many warning signs as you can that you might recognize as a bystander. So, um, for instance, one of the all, so there's going to be three groups. One group is going to be sexual violence, second group, dating domestic violence, the third group, stalking. For instance, if you get put into the dating and domestic violence breakout room, um, the only, so basically what's going to happen is as soon as I put you in this breakout room, the group needs to designate somebody to report out and keep track of all these things that you come up with. But what I want y'all to do is in that dating and domestic violence breakout room, as a bystander, what are warning signs that you might notice when somebody is experiencing dating or domestic violence? And I just want you to come up with your own list. Does that all make sense? And you'll do that for whichever group that you're placed in. Can I get a thumbs up if that makes sense? Cool. Okay, cool. cool. All right. And then. So let's break out one, break out two. Oh, and Deanna, you can hop out of that breakout room. For whatever reason, I think when you put people in the breakout rooms, they immediately, like everybody goes except the person who puts people in the rooms. Um, all right, so again, there's gonna be three groups. Look for the name of the group that you're in. It'll be either sexual assault, dating domestic violence, or stalking. And everybody's going to get three minutes that's it. Three minutes to come up with as many warning signs for whatever topic that you're at that you potentially might notice as a bystander. Um, and we're off. Good luck. And we'll report out afterwards. Welcome back. Welcome back. Nice to see lovely. Wow. Lovely faces on screens now. I don't see names. Love it. All right, so from the sexual assault group, who would like to report out, or actually, I'm sorry, let's start with stalking. Let's start with the stalking group. Who wants to report out on the warning signs that their group came up with for the stalking breakout room? I, I got it down little list. Um, okay. So some really Could good Could you introduce ones. yourself, please? Oh, uh, hi, my name is Ellie and my pronouns are she, they, and I'm part of the CERC committee. Okay. 
Um, and so some of the um, warning signs that people mentioned were like being paranoid of like, or avoiding places that you normally would go to. Like if there's certain places that you routine, but then your friend starts avoiding that place because they think they might run into someone there that they don't want to see or even sticking to crowded places. Um, and someone else mentioned um, how it can be through social media as well. Like someone keeps mm -hmm. commenting on your post or like if you post where you are, that's also available for people to see. Um, but it's also like as a bystander for us, like if we're gonna be a bystander like in physical presence, then we can also look at someone's um, like physical behavior or their reaction um, to another person's presence, like mm -hmm. do they seem uncomfortable or like do they change the way they talk or if they want to leave? But those were some of the warning signs. Okay. What is the, are there any stalking warning signs that other people might want to name as well that weren't mentioned already for stalking? Um, so a lot of like uh, repeated unwanted phone calls, text messages, um, messages over like DMs on social media platforms. Again, showing up where people may be often. Um, also like for instance, like Snapchat automatically shares people's locations. Like that's not even a preference that you have to go in and like initiate and then it shows your location. Like Snapchat already does that for you. Um, and so that's one way that somebody could potentially um, try to follow somebody is through using whatever is available to them. And maybe they're not friends with the person that they're trying to cause harm to, but they're friends with other people. And so maybe they'll try to gather information from those other people to figure out where this person is. Um, not wanting to go anywhere by themselves um, or completely changing their route to class. Um, if somebody is experiencing stalking and that person is literally on their normal route to class and that person doesn't want to go on that route anymore, like, uh, like as a friend, I would want to check in and be like, what's that about? Are you just taking a long walk or, or a longer walk or something like that? Like, that's something where I would want to check in and be like, hey, is everything okay? Um, tracking on other social media websites. Uh, yeah, those are fairly good. Um, what about dating domestic violence? Who wants to report out for dating and domestic violence group? Um, I took a few notes on that one. Cool, could you share for us? Could you introduce yeah. yourself? Yeah, of course. Um, I'm Gerlene Pablo, pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm an on-campus senator this year. So we were discussing some of the signs of dating and domestic violence. Um, so things like seeing someone less than you used to, if they slowly, you know, they're spending so much time with their partner that you know you see them a lot less than you used to or needing permission from a partner in order to do just you know day-to-day -day activities um, um and obviously physical signs of harm if there's domestic violence if maybe you see them but they're covering themselves up um or you do notice some signs of physical harm or if they're isolating themselves or you notice that they're being isolated by their abuser if they're you know they feel like they can't go out as much um that they need to be around them or if their abuser isn't allowing them to. Mm -hmm. um, and then also signs of emotional abuse, such as like, if you notice that that person seems to be degrading their own self-worth, it could be a sign mm. that their partner is initiating those thoughts for them. Mm. Mm. That was a really great list. Um, is there anything else that people want to add before I add some more myself? Um, I think gaslighting is a, big one especially you, it's something that you can see between couples I've, it's something that I've personally seen and it's like having some if the like the abuser in the relationship they have them questioning themselves um they belittle them a lot they're very aggressive in the way that they interact with them and just like kind of un, undermining and invalidating their emotions mm -hmm. and experiences is like a clear warning sign yes 100 percent um and gaslighting is becoming more and more prevalent. Um, uh, yeah, but thank you for pointing that out. Um, 
the list that I usually like to go through as well, this isn't a comprehensive list of warning signs, but it can be something like coercion or threatening them to do something, um, intimidating them, name calling, isolating them, controlling their time, money, way they dress, the decisions that they can make. An example of that, and this might seem really small and, and it's not minimizing harm whatsoever, but there's, I did a training at my former institution and I had an attendee tell me that they once dated somebody that would not allow them to cut their hair a certain way. Like that might seem really small, but like that's such a controlling thing to do and to have that power over somebody. Um, and so even if something that's just as, something as simple as just as not able to cut your hair a certain way or to dye your hair a certain way, anything like that, like that's control. Um, and that's definitely a harmful warning sign. Humiliating them, insulting them, and humiliating them, insulting them, especially in front of other people. Um, quite often, abusers will and perpetrators will do that even with other people around. Um, and it's so, the, it's such, it's so normal for them to be doing that that it like a like they'll just brush it off like it's not oh it's it's not harmful but no it's actually incredibly harmful. Um, physical abuse, right? If we think about this list that I'm about to say, if you're not consenting to any of this, then this is harm. Pinching, hitting, kicking, hair pulling, strangling, restraining, shoving, punching, and slapping. Um, even for something, even tickling. If somebody's not consenting to being tickled, like that's being harmful. That's taking their agency away. Um, and then sexual abuse could look something like unwanted, just touching, uh, kissing in general, uh, forcing them to have sex, forcing them to do sexual things that they don't want to do, and then not letting them use birth control. Uh, that's another form of control as well, um, and another form of sexual abuse. But yeah, that was, you already had a pretty comprehensive list altogether. Um, and then Aaron also mentioned, I also think things like checking each other's phones seems very normalized now, but it can be extremely invasive and unhealthy. And you mentioning this warning sign, which I completely agree with you, um, reminded me uh, uh, that for like stalking is such a normalized thing now. Our society normalized stalking, like, like Facebook stalking, Instagram stalking. Um, you, the Netflix series, that is a dramatization of stalking. Um, even the movie, Because I Love You, there's a, uh, I believe the example we've used in the past, Twilight, there's even stalking that happens in Twilight, some sort of just like power and control over somebody, right? Um, and then I see there's a question, a hands raised. Yeah, I was, so you mentioned just now about um, not taking birth control as like, you know, like not allowing your partner to take birth control. I'd never thought of that one before. So I was just wondering like maybe if forcing someone to take birth control might also count in the same category. It could potentially, yeah. Um, I, it, yeah, I mean, it could potentially be like forcing them to take the medicine, even though they like, and forcing them to take that birth control, even though they may not want to take that birth control. Um, but yeah, it, that specific one, um, when I for, when we were tr when I was trained under Green Dot uh, over three years ago now that was one that I had never thought about before um, and I was really taken aback by and I mean that could be really just in, tampering with any any form of birth control really um, and controlling that in any way but it could be potentially um, trying to force them and it could be something like slipping like slipping that in like their drinks or something like that, you know? Um, but it's usually the other way around, but it could potentially happen. It could be something like refusing to wear condoms, yep. Um, and even like tampering with condoms as well. Um, we know that's also a warning sign that can happen. And so, yeah, those are really great. Thank you for pointing those out, everyone. Um, 
sexual assault. What are warning signs that might lead to a sexual assault? What group, what group wants to lead that? Hello. I'll go Hi. start off mentioning the warning signs. And um, my name is Michelle, Michelle Kasabe. I'm a third year and I currently represent Public and Mental Health Commission and SCORE. So for what our breakout session has come up with, um, some, someone mentioned how a warning sign would be a person would feel uncomfortable with physical contact, such as not going for hugs, any sort of touch, etc. Uh, another person mentioned a person that someone would have depressive episodes and like off days. Another person said that someone will be pulling away from friends, not being really talkative or social with them. Another person also mentioned um, either hypersexual isolation or activity. I may have misheard them. Another person also said that warning sign, another sign could be they're becoming distant with everyday activities, like not really doing mm -hmm. things that they're usually doing. And uh, another one was change in eating patterns, either eating less or more. Mm -hmm. And the last warning sign we came up with was bruises on the body. And mm -hmm. yeah, pretty much it. Yeah, nice. and you probably did not hear that. You probably did. You probably heard that correctly about the hypersexualization because it can go both ways. Um, somebody might have a severe fear of in intimacy um, or just fear of sex in general, or because it's it can go kind of either way. Because um, every situation and every single individual is unique in their own needs on um, for for healing and for um healing from that traumatic experience and so mm -hmm. yeah you mentioned quite a lot actually um using drugs or alcohol to incapacitate somebody um and it's persistently and consistently trying to get them to and thank you so much for sharing michelle um just trying to persistently get them to drink more and more um or to just incapacitate them however that may be uh, pushing through boundaries um, and pushing through boundaries to essentially see is anybody paying attention um, I'll also mention a sequence that typically happens that 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 sometimes can happen leading up to a sexual assault um, and there's sort of five steps that you might see all of these you might only see one or two parts of them but typically um, like there's parts of the these five steps that happen and I'll mention in a second but pushing through boundaries to see if anybody's going to intervene or stop them from going any further in general and if no one's paying attention to the situation then they're going to try to isolate that person and then there's isolation especially if they're with a group um, they'll use intimidation um, they'll threaten them they'll use physical force if they have to um, unwanted touching and unwanted sexual contact um, Another warning sign, so contact with them if they're asleep or they're passed out. Um, and unwanted physical or sexual contact is part of a hazing or group settings or some sort of an initiation. Um, and then, so there, the pattern that is often seen in leading to a sexual assault like I mentioned, it's in five, uh, it's usually like a five sequence thing, but uh, you might see a whole sequence, you might only see one or two things from it, but uh, just to think about these things in your mind. So usually the first thing is uh, that person will select somebody that they believe that can be coerced because of age, power, or their degree of intoxication. Um, they'll build trust, and then they'll push alcohol or other substances and test boundaries with them um, to see if anybody will intervene or stop that person altogether. Um, from there, they'll try to isolate the intended person that they wanna cause harm to. Um, and then, so there's some sexual contact. So if it's with consent and both parties have the capacity for that consent, then it's over. Uh, if there is no consent, then they'll try to use um, They'll try to use force or threats to get that person to uh, submit and then termination. So they'll act as if nothing happened or they'll threat that person. They'll threaten that person if they do or try to say anything about it whatsoever. Again, you might not see that whole sequence. You only might see parts of that sequence. Um, but typically 
that's uh, a sequence that's often seen in a sexual assault. These were really comprehensive. This was really good. Um, Y'all did really well coming up and brainstorming all of these things. So great job. I'm going, oh my goodness, did my thing just minimize? Oh, I'm so sorry. Zoom life. Cool. All right. So, oh my goodness. Solution. So, we just talked about warning signs. Remember, warning signs are called red dots. So, how do we intervene when we actually see any of this kind of harm happening in the first place? We use these things called green dots, and that's where the name of the whole program comes from. Um, Green dots are something that we can actually do to stop a potential red dot happening in progress. So a, red, uh, a green dot could be something as simple as checking in on a classmate saying like, hey, I've been worried. You've missed the last three classes. What's going on? Um, it could be something as simple as asking somebody, hey, are you OK when you see something that's uncomfortable? It could be something as simple as sharing that concern with an RA um, or somebody in a leadership position y'all are all in leadership position sharing it to somebody else within as or um in any of the professional staff in um as asking them like hey i need help there's a situation going on i don't know how to help right um spilling a drink it's a really simple one that could cause some sort of a distraction and stop that harm from getting any worse altogether um a lot of times people think green dots need to be these big drastic acts that they're wearing some sort of a superhero cape and they need to do this big old grand act. But a lot of the times it's just simple small things like spilling a drink, asking for directions, telling that like if people are comfortable enough, going up themselves and telling that person to stop, that's harmful and explaining that to them. Um, getting groups of friends to help out in the situation, right? Um, each one of those red dots begin, or each one of those green dots begin to add up on that map, right? And it's when more of these green dots start to outweigh those red dots, that's when we're really starting to change the culture on the campus. Um, but we obviously know that there are barriers to intervention. Uh, we have these things called personal barriers, relationship barriers. So personal barriers, if you're introverted, afraid of Escalation, fear of retaliation, that's a huge, huge barrier for a lot of people. You're uncertain about the situation. You're not really sure if you should intervene or not. And you don't want to make a scene. Like you just don't want to make the situation any worse than you may feel like it currently is. You don't want to be embarrassed in that situation itself. Um, these are all normal. These are all very human barriers to have. Uh, Relationships, social barriers. You don't want to break an unspoke, unspoken rule within your friendship group. Uh, you don't want to be like the squeaky wheel of the group that's, that's trying to stop all the fun or something like that. Um, uncomfortable confronting a friend, right? You might know the person who's directly causing that harm. You might know the person who's receiving that harm. So intervening could be just a barrier for you just simply because you don't want to make this situation any more uncomfortable between you and that friend more than it may be already. Um, an example is that when I was in grad school, I was going to a concert. It was before I, it was the year before I ever did an internship around this kind of work. And I was at this concert and I tell people I had my metaphorical horse blinders on like I was just focused on myself I was having fun I was just trying to get away grad school was really tough at that time and I remember about halfway through the show a few rows up ahead of me I saw this man groping and assaulting this woman and I could clearly see just how uncomfortable she was and i'm sure everybody is familiar with that uncomfortable feeling in the pit of your stomach when you see something that looks really concerning and you feel like you should be doing something about that like has everybody had that weird nauseous stomach feeling before that gut reaction like that is the feeling that i had in my stomach at that moment and 
regrettably, I didn't do anything. I just, I was frozen in my, in my own two, in my, like where I, where I was. And I didn't know about Green Dot at the time. And I didn't really understand that, oh yeah, like I have a barrier. How can I get around that barrier? Um, but looking back, I easily could have just told the security guard who is literally within 10 feet of me to go and stop this from happening. Um, but I didn't. Um, you're not like a morally bad person just because you didn't intervene, right? It's just important for you to recognize what are barriers that are most common for you and then learning, which we're about to teach y'all, how to use the 3Ds to intervene in any of these situations and getting around those barriers. So you're, you're not, you don't have to be worried about that barrier. It's how can you work with that barrier and get around it by using one of the 3Ds, um, which is what we're actually about to do. And so the 3Ds. If there's anything that you take away from this presentation, it's definitely remembering the 3Ds. Direct, delegate, distract. Distract, direct, delegate, delegate, distract, direct. Literally, I don't care how you remember them, remember the 3Ds. These are lifelong skills that you can use to intervene in any situation where you think you need to intervene and you feel like there's harm happening in that moment. You, again, you can use any of these 3Ds if you're seeing racism, sexism happening, um, transphobia, like literally any, like any sort of ism you can use to intervene and stop that harm from happening. But directly intervening, you yourself doing something about that situation in that moment, um, asking that person, hey, stop what you're doing, checking on someone that you might be worried about, just asking, them, hey, is everything okay? Asking someone just, hey, is everything okay is probably one of the most effective green dots that you can do, quite honestly. Um, an anecdote about that is I was doing something, I was doing a training super similar to this. It was a green dot training, but it wasn't care because it wasn't at UCSB. But after this training, uh, it was at, it was at a campus or it was a student organization. A student came up at, to me afterwards and was like, oh my gosh, Sven, I did a green dot and I had no idea that I did a green dot. And I was like, tell me, like, please, I wanna know. Like, I love hearing when people actually are doing these green dots on our campus, because that means they're literally stopping harm from happening in the first place. And so she ended up telling me that she was at a, she was at some sort of an event or something like that. And there was a couple on a bench kind of away from everybody else and they were arguing and she, was super concerned because she did not think that this was arguing at all. She thought it was more severe than arguing. And she vividly remembered having this gut feeling, right? And when I mentioned that in our training, she was like, oh my gosh, like I remember having that gut feeling. She said, all she did was go up to them and ask them, hey, is everything okay? And they both kind of looked at her with this really odd face and were like, yeah, everything's fine. We're just bickering like an old couple kind of thing. She's like, okay, I just wanted to make sure that's all. And she went on her way. And then she said about 10 minutes later, that same couple ended up coming up to her at the event. And they asked her like, why did you ask us if we were okay? We were just sitting on the bench talking. And she then told, she then told that couple how what she saw and she heard seemed so harmful and she knew that she wouldn't have wanted to experience any, anything like that. That's why she intervened. And they thanked her. They were like, oh, thank you so much for telling me uh, like, why you intervened. Because most people would have never intervened in the first place. Like, we bicker like this all the time. And so something as simple as that, even if it's not a situation that ultimately could be as harmful as you may think, you still are adding a green dot to the map, right? Delegating delegating to another trusted person, just asking somebody else to get involved. You could be with a group of friends, maybe pulling some group of people aside and asking them to help you in that situation. Maybe you know the person, maybe there are friends of the person who's causing the harm around. Grab them and be like, hey, do you not see what your friend's doing? Like, go stop that person right now. Um, letting uh, just uh, somebody in the leadership position know what's going on and asking them to help out in a situation. Like the slide says, staff member, trusted peer, the bartender, um, asking a family friend to check in. Um, just delegating is all about getting other people to help you in that situation. Um, and maybe you intervene with the person who's receiving the harm 
and you could ask a friend to delegate and intervene with the person who's causing that harm, right? So you can use direct and delegate all within the same, uh, the same scenario. Then distract. Honestly, you can do a lot with distract because you can quite literally do anything to cause some sort of distraction, right? You're trying to diffuse the situation so that way things can calm down in that moment. For example, it could be something as simple as spilling a drink accidentally. I feel like we probably all have been in a, uh, uh, a restaurant or a fast food place. Somebody spills their cup of water or their drink or something on the, or their silverware falls on the ground and the whole restaurant just like kind of like looks at them because it's obviously loud and it's distracting noise, right? Um, asking somebody to borrow their phone, asking for a ride. Um, a really common one I heard a lot last year on campus was uh, students frequently for distract said, oh, hey, your bike's getting stolen. Everybody rides their bike on campus, letting them know that, hey, your bike's getting stolen, right? Um, anything to diffuse that situation in that moment so that way there's less harm happening, right? Um, the distract I always use comes from a fellow Green Dot colleague of mine from my old institution I was at. She was at the grocery store in line checking out and there were two gentlemen in front of her. She said, as she was waiting in line, these two guys started to bicker and it was escalating so quickly that one of them shoved the other one. And in that instant, she reached into her bag and pulled out a little bottle of bubbles from a wedding that she had been at. And she literally blew bubbles above these two guys that were literally getting into a physical argument. And in that split instant that she did that, the two guys, she said, were so just, they were like, where did these bubbles just come from? That they're so distracted from that, they stopped fighting. She told the cashier, call your manager over and get help. The cashier immediately used the intercom to ask the manager to come over and the manager de-escalated the whole situation, all from a bottle of bubbles, right? And so I think it's important to just reiterate, like I'm not asking people to do these big old grand gestures. Like you can quite literally almost do anything to help defuse that situation in that moment. Um, it's just important for you to do something that works best for you, given whatever kind of barriers you have. So if you're fear, uh, fear of retaliation, fear of escalation, introverted, just uh, direct is probably not the way that you personally would go. So if that's one of your barriers, you have delegate and distract. I know a lot of introverted people that would still do some sort of a distraction. I know plenty of people that are fearful of it escalating or coming back at them uh, and retaliating that they would still do some sort of a distraction, right? Or they could just delegate to somebody else to help them in that situation. Um, the important thing is for y'all to just recognize what barriers do you have and what ways should you intervene, right? I'm not asking y'all to come up with a list of things to always refer back to. It's just a few things that you could always go back to um, given any sort of a situation, right? So what we're actually gonna do next is we're gonna do another activity. So what's gonna happen is in the chat box, I am going to put the scenario in the chat box. And what's gonna happen is I'm gonna put everybody into, uh, I'm gonna put everybody into breakout rooms again, but we're not gonna, we're gonna recreate these breakout rooms. Let's do, let's do six people per group. All right, so there's gonna be six different breakout rooms. Um, I'm going to copy and paste and put the first scenario into the chat so you all can see that whenever you go into it. But the first scenario is gonna pop up and you're gonna have two minutes in your breakout room to come up with as many ways to intervene as you possibly can, right? So also, designate somebody to write down information and everything, uh, like the list of things that you're coming up with to intervene. But I don't want y'all to only literally come up with direct, I would direct, I would distract, I would delegate, I would delegate. Well, what ways would you delegate? What ways would you distract, right? So imagine yourself as a bystander in all of these scenarios, and we're gonna do one scenario at a time, but 
So I'm gonna copy and paste it. You're gonna have two minutes in your breakout room, and then we're gonna come back, report out, and move on to the next scenario. So your first one, oh no. Sorry. I had a bit of a glitch on my end. Where did this? Sorry, I know my screen's paused right now. Sorry about that, y'all. All right, should be back. All right, so the scenario. All right, so y'all have two minutes to list, come up with as many ways to intervene as you can for this scenario. All right, so I think everybody's back. Um, all right, so uh, breakout room number one. I think we have like six different breakout rooms, I think, potentially. Yeah, just breakout room number one. Uh, what ways did you come up with to intervene? Who wants to share out with that? I can go ahead and share for. Yeah, go right ahead. Uh, oh, my name's Dan Segura, pronouns he, his, rising fourth year, um, part of Trans and Queer Commission, and a couple other things. But some of the examples we used were like kind of similar to what you're saying, like letting them know, like your car is being towed, there's something wrong with your bike, et cetera. But then also just kind of talking about either just being direct with them and going up to them, like, hey, are you okay? Um, you know, just trying to make sure, obviously, if you feel safe doing so, confronting someone, but then also just kind of maybe going up to them and saying like, hey, can you help me look for our other friend? Like, I really need your help. And then kind of yeah. taking them away from the situation in that sense. I know that's something that I've done myself at parties. Um, just kind of like, yeah, I, I really need your help right now. Can, can you please come? I'm sorry for interrupting. And then checking in with them after that and making sure they're okay. Nice. I want, I, want, I want to hear more people because there's a couple that you just said that I want to add to. Um, it's like, hey, I need to go to the bathroom real quickly, but go ahead. Who was that? Oh, I heard somebody speak. That was me. Where Can I you? add something? Oh, who's me? Where are you? Oh, I'm Natasha. I Natasha. Can... Natasha's not. Oh, there's Natasha. Sorry. I was just trying to figure out where your name was so I can. No, you're good. I can. Um... You're good. What, 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 uh, what, what? what these did you come up with to intervene um well it was it's kind of the same thing or one of the same things that daniel was saying but i was just thinking in case you don't know the person because parties can often be quite uh -huh. big um and especially in a situation where um it's like a big group of people leading one person you're not necessarily sure i would probably um either be direct as someone said but also maybe go and like compliment their outfit or something and just inject myself yeah. into the situation yeah if i don't know them just be like oh my gosh your skirt's so cute where did you get it and then if they can't respond or whatever just be like are you okay like mm -hmm. do you know these people whatever um just to be a little more of like a i don't know not not because i i like in those situations you may not know if the people that they're surrounded by they might get upset easily just just like a way to kind of do it under the radar um, right. so it's not like it doesn't become aggressive or um confrontational right from the get-go unless it needs to be obviously but if you can kind of de-escalate and just yeah. get yourself in the conversation that's what those are great it. that's a great example for sure breakout room two or any Anybody who wants to go next who's part of a breakout room? I actually didn't check um, which breakout room I was in, but okay. um, I did write down notes for mine. Um, it's okay. So, uh, hi, I'm Layla. I'm a rising freshman, and I'm part. I'm the education coordinator for SASA. Um, and we kind of uh, came up with like two, like one was like direct, and then the other was delegate. The direct way was like to walk up to them and like pretend that you know the drunk person and like try to get mm. them away from that situation and kind of say anything to get them away um like saying general stuff um that you would like normally say at a party like um sort of like 
there's something that we can do over here. Let's go and do it. Mm. Um, like, um, oh, your friend is here. Let's go talk to them. Like, they just arrived. Let's go, like, just kind of trying to, like, direct them away from the person. Um, and then also, like, if you don't know the person um, or are, like, less comfortable doing that, like, maybe finding someone that actually knows that person and just saying mm -hmm. like hey do you think this situation is safe like do you know both of them like maybe we should like intervene in this situation and kind of like going that direction um might also work those are great examples and especially in iv it's it's like oh hey let's go to pmh and grab a slice or something like that i know nobody says it in that way most likely but y'all know what i mean when i say that right um just simple things like that could be like, oh, hey, you know, we're actually about to leave and go grab some food before heading back home. Um, just anything to do to get out of that situation. That's not bad. And it's, I, I love the one about if, like acting like you know the person because I'm personally somebody who would do that. Um, and it's always an interesting thing to do, that's for sure. All right, well, because of time and I want to be able to get to other scenarios, um, I'm going to put the second scenario in the chat and then I'll break y'all up into, whoa, into the breakout rooms again. All right, so your scenario, it'll be in the chat as well, but you notice a couple in a parking lot arguing loudly. He grabs his boyfriend by the arm aggressively, and you're getting concerned about the rapid escalation. Come up with as many ways to intervene as you possibly can. And welcome back. So for groups or folks that I haven't heard from yet, your scenario was you notice a couple in a parking lot that are arguing loudly. He grabs his boyfriend by the arm aggressively and you're getting concerned about the rapid escalation. What ways did you come up with to intervene for folks that I haven't heard from yet? Um, I can speak for group three. Sure. Um, my name's Ash, I use she, hers pronouns, and I'm with the Trans and Queer Commission as well as EVPSA office. Um, something we said was probably going up to the couple and like saying, making up something about your car, bike or whatever, saying I need help with it um you know just say like a light's on in my car and I don't know what it means mm. uh someone else said if you have a few friends you can go and defuse the situation like mm -hmm. physically with them asking what's wrong but I feel like that's a bit dangerous so I don't know about that but yeah okay yeah maybe getting in between people if somebody feels comfortable enough mm -hmm. um yeah what other ways did people uh, come up with. Any other group? I know y'all are there. Asking for directions or to use a phone. If folks feel more comfortable uh, typing it into the chat, please feel free to type it into the chat. What ways did y'all come up with? Asking, but definitely asking for directions. Uh, I'd even say honking your car horn if your car or setting your car alarm off. That's also a pretty big distraction as well. Um, pretty common answer that we usually get as well. Are there any other ways to intervene for this situation? Anybody else want to share in general for this situation? Um, I think yeah. because how someone said that it could get dangerous, you can also delegate. Um, we, I, if it was in person, we do have like the CSO officers or sometimes just like the IV police. Um, just if you think that the situation like calls for it, because how the Ash said it, you might be dangerous, but you want to keep yourself and the other person mm -hmm. safe. Yeah, so I guess in that moment, it's really going to depend on like, what do you feel like is the, like, is it severe to the point where you need to call like a CSO or something? Yeah, that's definitely could be potentially an option. Oh, and I see Lily. Yes, I was thinking making noise to break up their argument. 
yeah, in general, just making a noise. Um, yeah, and, or ooh, and not, like if you're on can asking for directions, oh, yeah, you even mentioned that. Um, cool. Well, y'all came up with a fairly decent list as well. Um, and for time purposes, we're just going to move on. Uh, we have a few more scenarios, but I want to make sure to get to the rest of the content. Okay, so what are the three Ds? Direct. Distract. Right, one. We got two. Direct, distract, delegate. Yes. I don't care how you remember the three Ds. Just remember the three Ds. Because um, you can use that at any point in time. There's harm happening or you have that uncomfortable gut feeling in the pit of your stomach and you feel like you need to be intervening and doing something about that. Always remember what those three Ds are. Um, chances are if you see me on campus or I have another presentation with you, I'm going to ask, and I, and I recognize a face, I'm going to ask you, what are the three Ds? Always remember what they are. Because um, they're so incredibly useful. I get so excited about that. Sorry if I'm a little like hyper about it. Proactive green dots. So we got red dots, green dots, the three Ds, and then we have proactive green dots. Proactive green dots are essentially things that we can do to begin stopping red dots before they ever even start in the first place. And they're essentially resetting our campus norms. That's what we're trying to do. Like ultimately that's what this program is trying to do. It's trying to create a new culture and new social norms on our campus for two things. One, this type of violence is not okay and should not be tolerated. And two, everyone is expected to play a part in preventing this violence. Because this isn't something that's just placed on the responsibility of survivors. This isn't just replaced on the responsibility of another group of people. Like, it takes, this takes everybody to play their part in ultimately ending this form of violence altogether. Um, and so, what can proactive green dots look like, right? So, Looking back to our map, there's a lot of empty space in between all of these green dots and a lot of empty space between all these red dots, right? So how do we fill them? We fill them with these, it's not an animated slide, but imagine these like opaque green circles getting bigger and bigger, right? So like they're starting to just fill these spaces more and more. And ultimately, there should be no empty space on our campus at all for red dots to exist. It's just green. Like if we are just to plaster the campus in green in our community, that's when the norms are really starting to change, right? It could be as simple as wearing a green dot pen, right? Just getting people to recognize, oh, what, what's green dot? And maybe even asking about it. I will make sure that everybody gets green dot stickers. Um, I don't know that, I don't know how we'll be able to do that, but I'll be sure to get everybody get stickers. But I got to a green dot sticker, right? We finally have a logo. So what does that mean? We can market. We can actually start to give these things out in a way at programs so people can then put it on all their stuff. Like a really easy thing to do that I, like a, an, an example is, imagine if you walked into a classroom and you were the only person that didn't receive, that did not get a green dot sticker and everybody else has their green dot stickers all over their stuff. Like you would be like, well, what's green dot? Like, if you were to join this new group and you saw all this stuff and you saw people talking about, you know, this content or what the 3Ds are, like, you'd be like, what is this, right? Um, even these green dot shirts, you go through, we were going to do an event in April and give these away for free. I don't know how we're going to do that this year with it being virtual, but that'll come as well. Posting a bystander story on social media, right? If you see somebody that's actually intervening in a situation, put it online. Tell people why you believe that this was such a great thing to do and why we all need to be playing a part in preventing that violence. Um, liking, sharing, commenting on somebody's post. Asking a professor to bring in a bystander training class. Like the fact that the Senate has now made it required, I think it's part of y'all's bylaws now, right? Like everyone, all of the Senate leaderships were required to go through some sort of sexual violence prevention training, right? That's now becoming institutionalized within your institution and organization as associated students. So every single year, more and more people are gonna know what this content is. And y'all have influence over certain people, right? Y'all are all within a leadership position in some way, shape, or form. So it could be as simple as having a conversation or just a text with somebody and being like, 
wow, I just did this two hour training with Sven from Care. He talked about Green Dot. What, what's Green Dot? Tell them, like tell them all about Green Dot, right? Retell some sort of a Green Dot story in the sense of like, well, how did you intervene in a situation that's harmful, right? Um, whenever we like, we'll have some more like social media graphics at the beginning of the year, but um, yeah, like following our, uh, I think we have a Gaucho, we, yeah, Gaucho Green Dot should be our Instagram handle. Um, putting stuff up in your room, putting stuff up all across campus, brochures, um, positive reinforcement. If you see somebody doing a green dot and actually intervening and stopping harm, like thank them for it, acknowledge them for it. Let them know like, hey, you did something really great. Like, thanks for making like the world a better place, literally. Um, Cause obviously we want more of that to happen. And so when somebody does something positive, smile, thank them for it. Uh, acknowledge that, that they did that in the first place. Participate in class discussions. Um, like if I, I know that I, like I've been starting to try to reach out to a lot of professors, it's like, don't cancel your class. Don't cancel this week's class. Like if anything, request a care workshop or request a green dot workshop. Right. Or if you are a, uh, if you are a president or you have some other leadership position and you're involved in some clubs or another organization on campus and you want your group or your club or your org to know this content talk to me, ask for Sven and ask, hey, we'd like Green Dot to come for our, our training, right? Um, and we can definitely do a virtual one just like this, right? Uh, is, I think uh, I will be wrapping up here in the next like five minutes or so, folks that are curious. Um, right, so the idea and the question is, if a new student were to come to your campus, how would they know that one, violence is not tolerated and everyone is expected to play a part in preventing their violence? Um, so for instance, like something that y'all are already doing is this in and of itself. Like hopefully y'all would want more of AS to go through this and just not the Senate, right? Um, hopefully more people would want to go through this and want to share that, oh wow, we actually learned a lot of really great things. We learned literally lifelong skills. Um, but ultimately, we want all these green dots to get better and uh, to get bigger and to be more prominent and to be more uh, just consistent on our campus in terms of people doing green dots and buying into this. The idea is no one has to do everything, everyone has to do something. And I highly suggest, I, and I can even forward these things to Diana and Holly as well, but Green Dot has been studied by um, by agencies to see the like efficacy of the programs themselves, and they've adapted Green Dot for K through five that focuses on bullying, middle school, uh, kind of is bullying, but it starts to get into a little bit of violence, uh, like IPV kind of violence, and then high school it focuses more on interpersonal violence, and then college it's just interpersonal violence and I mean, these studies are showing that after like five years, the rate of violence can be reduced by a significant amount. I believe the study for high schools, 12 high schools in the state of Kentucky received Green Dot, 12 high schools did not receive Green Dot. At the end of five years, the rate of violence was reduced by something like 50%, five zero, like some outrageous statistic, right? That same, that study that was done on college campuses, that was a similar kind of a study, that statistic is like 17 to 23% or something like that. Like imagine every five years, simply for creating this new culture, less harm is happening simply because people are doing green dots and people are understanding that violence is not tolerated and everyone needs to do their part in preventing that violence. So what are the three Ds? I'll ask just one last time. What are the three Ds? Direct, delegate, distract. Direct. Delegate, distract. I don't care how I remember them, just remember the three Ds. Um, and if anybody needs uh, to contact me for a presentation or anything like that, uh, Diana could also provide that, but I am going to write that in the meeting. And yeah, for that, I'm finished, folks.
Thank you all so much for joining us today. I truly appreciate it. Sorry. Thank you so much, Sven, for providing this presentation to the group. Um, so much appreciate your time and, um, and your facilitation of this conversation. Um, I want to just say that I think that it's, you know, a conversation that's important to keep coming back to um, throughout the time that we're all at the university. And as you said, well, well beyond that time. And I think just the importance of us learning this together as well is a, is a really big deal so that we have kind of common language and common tools that we're using um, as we're having these conversations. Um, I also want to just say one other thing, which is that I, I think that these are very difficult and um, sensitive conversations to be having. And I really want to ask you as our student leaders to be really conscious of what those conversations are that are happening, whether it's during the middle of a webinar uh, in the breakout groups or anywhere else, um, that these conversations can be triggering to other folks that are involved in them. And so to really be just aware um, of that sensitivity um, as we're coming out of this space um, and the best ways that we can get engaged with each other um, in those conversations. Uh, so thank you all very much, Sven. If you, if you have any final words from you or we're good to go. And yeah, I hope y'all have a wonderful rest of your week. I can't believe it's Wednesday and the classes start in a month. That's wild. It's amazing. <laughs> thank you so much, Sven. Uh, have a great afternoon, everybody.